Good morning. Uh, Open your Bible, if you will, to the book of Judges. In your Old Testament, the book of Judges, chapter 5. And once you find that, you can hold on to it, set it aside, and in a few minutes, we will come to, uh, to that passage. There are two passages that have come to my mind this week that I've been thinking about, and I'm going to try to tie them together somehow this morning. So we'll see how good of a job I do with that. Um, But the second of those two passages is in Judges chapter 5, and so we'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, Just real briefly, let me say that you know, uh, maybe you know, that we've been doing some lessons on worldview this year. Uh, One time each month is the plan for that. And uh, we've done four lessons so far, and the fifth lesson will be this coming Sunday, whatever that is, May the 10th. Um, And so if you have not heard those lessons or all of those lessons, I would encourage you to go to our website and listen to them, especially the last one in uh, in April was a morning we had a a few technical difficulties here at the building for our live stream. And so the audio on the on the YouTube video cuts in and out a little bit, but the full complete audio is on the website. Thanks to Robert recording that uh, through a different mechanism. And so um, if you want to go listen to the previous lesson, especially um, what's happening in that in that series, if you want to call it that, is that the first several lessons are kind of the foundation building blocks that the specific ideas as the year goes on will build on. And so it will be helpful, I think, to have those uh, freshly listened to or called to mind uh, as we go into our next lesson next Sunday. Uh, But for this morning, a couple passages that I've been thinking about, and the first of those is in Psalm 133. Actually, it is Psalm 133. It's not very long. This is the whole thing right here, three verses. Psalm 133, as you see on the screen in front of you, says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head. Coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down on the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded blessing, life forevermore. No beard is not the reason I've been thinking about this passage. Although some of us, not me, of course, as you can tell. I haven't had much success. Some of us have let our beards grow along in this quarantine of the last uh, month or so. But of course, I've thought of this passage because I have seen this to be so true among our people in the last six weeks or so. How good and pleasant it is for brothers to, to dwell together in unity. I give thanks for the unity among this congregation. You don't need me to tell you that uh, this particular crisis, like any hardship, uh, is and can be the source of conflict and division. Um, You know, because you see it every day, that everybody has their own opinion about what's going on. You can turn on the TV, depending on what channel or on what person is talking. Uh, There are all kinds of hot takes about uh, what's happening and what the solution is to this. And uh, you get on Facebook, and little did you know, all of your friends and family members are all of a sudden medical experts and experts in global pandemics. And they have all the answers, and of course, they don't all agree. And I say that a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, obviously, but the reality is even people that are experts, the medical doctors, the scientists, even they don't seem to fully agree on what's going on or what to be done about it. And this week compared to last week, compared to six weeks ago, compared to next week, opinions vary even more. And when things are hard, when people are either fearful uh, for their own health, they're fearful for their well-being, or they're frustrated uh, because they, they can't get out and work, or they're tired of being inside These fears and these frustrations just make the differences of opinion, or I could say can make the differences of opinion, uh, really turn into tension that can uh, turn people against each other or split people apart. You know this is a very real thing, and unfortunately, churches are not immune to this kind of conflict, this kind of division. But again, 
Uh, I will say that from my limited perspective, because I don't know all, from my limited perspective, I am just so thankful to God because what I see among our people is a spirit of flexibility, a spirit of support and encouragement and love being shared with one another. And um, I am again would say with the psalmist in Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this psalm, uh, but I do want to talk about some of the strange and fun things about this psalm, because it is weird. You know we talked about poetry not too long ago in a class on psalms. Poetry can be weird, and this psalm is one of the weirdest, because it says that this wonderful unity among God's people is like oil that flows down the head and the beard of Aaron all the way down his garments. What in the world is this talking about? I'm not really uh, all that sure, but it is a reference to the, the anointing of the high priest. Remember, Aaron was the first high priest. Exodus 30 describes that he, and then the, all the high priests that would succeed him, uh, they had oil poured on their head as a way to signify that they are the high priest of God. The high priest would be, uh, in many ways, a unifying figure. He's the, the one uh, person that goes into the most holy place, representing the people to bring that reconciliation between uh, God and the people. And so he would be a, a, a figure that people could be unified around. But I wonder if, if it's more so that oil, that, that precious oil, the psalm says, that signifies that he's been chosen by God. Unity is, is uh, um, sanctified. Unity is precious. Unity is, is given to God's people by him as a wonderful blessing that really can only truly be found in him. And some have, have, have pointed out that the oil flowing down from the head to the bottom of his garments uh, is a picture of, of bringing people together uh, from, from top to bottom, so to speak. But the second image, the second metaphor that's given is the dew of Hermon. Hermon being uh, one of the northernmost mountains, usually snow-covered throughout the year. The dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. Zion being where Jerusalem is located in the south of Israel in a very dry hill country, similar to the hill country we have here in Texas. And so the picture of unity there is that it is refreshing. Um, like that, that the top of that snow-covered hill bringing its, uh, its dew down to uh, dry Mount Zion. And again, maybe you have that north to south unifying of all things coming together. But unity is given by God. Unity is refreshing in a dry and barren world. And unity is a, uh, is a, is a key part of this last statement that the psalmist makes. That there at Mount Zion, the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. That's one of the beautiful things about the life that we have in God. That God gives us this life that we get to enjoy together. That as brothers and sisters in him, not only do we have eternal life ourselves, but we get to, again, participate with each other and experience and enjoy that together. Unity is a, is a beautiful thing, especially because of how rare it is in our world and of how precious it is among God's people. And again, I, I thank God for what I see of the unity among this in this congregation. But you realize that I can make that statement um, about this psalm. But I can say Psalm 133 is a picture of the unity that we have in God. Even though it's, it's using images, it's written by uh, you know, the Israelites. It's using images from the Old Testament, from the geography of Israel. If you're familiar with the, the Old and New Testaments, you, you understand that passages like this, because of Jesus, because of his unifying work as our high priest, in Jesus, we can read passages like this in the Old Testament and we can see ourselves described in it. And again, if you're familiar with the stories of the Old Testament, you understand that a passage like this in Psalm 133 is so beautiful. God's people dwelling together in unity, but you may remember that that was hardly ever the case in uh, historical Israel, that they were so often divided, not only amongst themselves, but separated even from their God. But there are, like Psalm 133, in the Old Testament, there are these glimpses of what it should be like 
there are these little pictures, snapshots of the ideal of what God truly desired. And then, as we have said, that becomes fulfilled in Jesus and in the new covenant. And so the other passage that has come to mind is also in the Old Testament, where I had you turn in Judges chapter 5. And Judges chapter 5 is itself, I think, another glimpse of what things should be like that was so often failed uh, in, or I should say, not lived up to among uh, Israel of old, but a passage, I think, that points us to what God desires for his people in Christ Jesus. And so let's look at Judges chapter 5 and think about this idea of unity. Let's hold that picture of Psalm 133 in our minds as we go through. And think about unity in victory, which is what we see described in Judges chapter 4 and 5. It may surprise you that we're going to the book of Judges to see a picture of what God desires among his people. Uh, the book of Judges is one of the darkest uh, books in the Old Testament in terms of how wicked and how uh, far from God uh, his people have drifted. Just very, very quickly, remember in the beginning of Judges, it describes how when the people came into the land, they failed to drive out all the inhabitants of the land, which meant that those people were left to be a thorn in their side and to draw them away from serving God. And once Joshua and his generation passed on, that's exactly what they did. They turned to serve other gods. And that kicks off what we call the cycle of the Judges, where the people would serve other gods and so God, to discipline them, would send uh, an, another nation to oppress them. And uh, in that oppression, they would call out to God for help. He would send a deliverer or a judge. And they would have a period of peace for X amount of years. And then before too long, they would be back to serving other gods. And so God would send another oppressor. And by the end of the book of Judges, we see how awful this has all become. And the stories at the end of the book of Judges are terrible. And the final uh, uh, word of the book of Judges, literally, in chapter 21 and verse 25, is that in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's what things had become in Israel during the time of the Judges. But... More so early on in the story of the judges, we do have glimpses. There are these moments when the people are delivered and there are acts of faith and there are, are, are pictures of what it should be like or what it could be like amongst God's people. And one of those is here in Judges chapter 4 and 5 with the story of Deborah and Barak. Between these two chapters, Judges 4 tells the story of what happens with Deborah and Barak. And then chapter 5, where we're going to spend most of our time, is a song that is sung in celebration after the story is concluded to remember and to celebrate what has been accomplished. But let's briefly just run through the story that's told in Judges chapter 4. Israel is again being oppressed because of their, uh, their idol worship. This time they're oppressed by the Canaanites, who they didn't drive out. Jabin is their king, but Sisera uh, is going to come into the story later. Sisera is the commander of the army of the Canaanites. And their big bad weapon is that they have 900 chariots of iron. And so they rule the plains. They rule the valley. Because uh, if you have 900 chariots of iron in those days, especially because in Israel they were lacking in weapons apparently, these are like tanks that uh, would mow down any, anything that would come up against them. So Sisera and the army of the Canaanites were terrorizing Israel for 20 years, we are told. And during this time, Deborah is judging Israel. Deborah is a little bit of a different type of judge. She's not a military leader, as we see other judges being. But it calls her a prophetess, the text does. And so she is judging or guiding Israel by speaking for the Lord and she is the one who calls Barak. By the way, this is probably something closer to Deborah and Barak. Uh, you know, but I'll just use the American pronunciation that I was raised with and say Deborah and Barak. But Deborah calls Barak and says, Barak, you're the guy. God, God has called you to lead the army to victory. 
And if you remember the story, in fact, John Moon taught our, our class on Deborah and Barak in our Hebrews 11 study. If you remember the story, Barak is not all for doing this right away. He says, well, I'm, I'm not so sure. And maybe you, maybe you don't blame him, uh, as intimidating as this would be. Uh, but he said, well, I'll go if you go with me, Deborah. And so Deborah says, well, okay, I'll go, but um, you're not going to get the glory. A woman will get the glory. And maybe we're thinking it's going to be her that will get the glory. But Barak, reluctant, does serve as the leader of the armies of Israel. And there's this amazing scene in Judges 4 where he leads his army uh, down the mount, down the mount of Tabor, into the valley, and they win the battle. Um, which may seem surprising to us if you think about the, uh, the, the sides here and how strong the Canaanites were. Judges 4 only tells us that the Lord routed the Canaanites on that day. Um, we're going to find out in Judges chapter 5 that um, there was a specific mechanism that God used, that he sent a storm and rain, it appears, maybe even an a, a earthquaking thunderstorm. And you can imagine that a storm would not be good for chariots pulled by horses. And so that clearly uh, assisted or maybe won the victory. But Barak and the armies are successful. Sisera, the commander of the Canaanites, jumps off of his chariot, makes a run for it. He finds somewhere to stop. He stops in the tent of Jael, the Kenite. Um, and Jael takes advantage of the opportunity. She lulls Sisera to sleep, literally. Um, and while he's sleeping, exhausted from the, uh, from the battle, she takes a tent peg. They lived in tents, the Kenites. And she drives that tent peg through Sisera's temple while he's sleeping. And so that, um, can I say it puts a nail in the coffin? I don't know. But uh, the, the, the battle is won and the enemy is killed. And the people of Israel, because of God, are victorious. Okay, that's the story. And uh, Judges chapter 5 sings a song of celebration about what God has done. And so let's look a little bit at the keys to victory given to us in Judges chapter 5. What is it about this battle and the, uh, the victory that is remembered and that is celebrated? And what, it is, what is it that we can learn from it? There's really just one verse. And this is the whole lesson in one verse. It's the first verse, the beginning of the song. In Judges 5, it says that Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, that leaders led in Israel, that the people volunteered, bless the Lord. This is it right here. That leaders led in Israel and that the people volunteered for this, praise the Lord, Deborah and Barak say. Let's talk about each of these uh, components one at a time here. They say that leaders led, and you might think, well, pff, that's what leaders do, right? That seems kind of a re redundant statement. But I actually think that you know that's not true. You know that not all leaders lead. Or maybe what we would say is that leadership is not just a title. Leadership is not just something that comes uh, inherently in a position. And you know, as well as I do, that there are leaders, people in position, that don't really lead. And there are people that don't have any sort of position or title and that they lead. And so you get the, the sense of this statement that leaders led. And I think there is a reference here to the people that do hold positions of leadership or positions of authority. And maybe, of course, Deborah and Barak come first to mind. Uh, Barak was a little bit reluctant, we know, but he is still included in Hebrews 11. By faith, Barak, or he's included in a list of judges that acted by faith. And someone had to lead that army, had to get out in front and run down the mountain and, and lead the charge. And Barak was willing to do that. It's pretty an amazing thing. But he took it on himself. And he stood up in front, having been uh, appointed apparently by God and been encouraged by Deborah. Barak was a leader that stood up and said, follow me to victory. Deborah herself, in a different way, uh, was a leader. And she's, again, called a prophetess. She says, it says that she judged Israel. 
But think about in this story in particular how she is a leader in a different way even than Barak. In fact, she's kind of the one that leads Barak in a, in a subtle but firm way. Encourages, pushes Barak to say, no, this is what you need to do. Deborah describes herself in this song, um, just a little bit out of context, but notice in verse 7, well, we'll back up a little bit just to see it all. In verse 6, it describes the situation in Israel until Deborah came about. Uh, it says, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, the days of Jael, the highways were deserted, the travelers went about in roundabout ways, the peasantry ceased, they ceased in Israel. So things are bad, people are hiding, people are taking the byways, staying off the main roads. It says, until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose, a mother in Israel. What a beautiful statement of the way that Deborah was a leader among God's people. She was a mother. She probably was uh, literally a mother, but I, I think the point is here is the way that she offered guidance and encouragement in a motherly way to the people. There's an interesting statement in the book of Romans in chapter 16 when Paul is sending his greetings to various people in the church in Rome. He says, greet Rufus and his mother and mine. Isn't that beautiful? That there was this woman, Rufus's mother, that Paul seems to be saying that she was a mother to me as well. Don't we have that in in the body of the Lord, isn't that such a wonderful thing that we have women that while the New Testament is, is clear that they do not uh, hold the same positional uh, authority, uh, positions of authority as men in a public way, still uh, we have women that lead and they serve this role as mothers and encouragers and I can speak for myself, um, and there are women, my wife, my own mother, and, and other women throughout my life that have pushed me, that have encouraged me, that have helped me, given me guidance, and I'm thankful for that. Barak was a leader. Deborah was a leader. The leaders led in Israel, but I think we could also point to others in the story, one in particular that though not a person in a position or a person with a title, they still stepped up and did what needed to be done and be, could be considered among the leaders that led. Jail, in particular, comes to mind. The song actually praises Jail, starting in verse 24 down to 27. We won't read all of that. It's rather violent as the story goes. But Jail was a nobody. And other than the story, of course, I don't know if we would have ever have heard of her. She had, didn't have a title. She didn't have a position. But when Sisera came to her tent, she saw an opportunity, saw an opportunity to act, to, to, to do something that would, would help the cause. No one had to tell her to do it. No one had to command her to do it. She did it. She took initiative to drive that tent peg through Sisera's head and to clinch the victory for God's people. And for that, the song says in verse 24, most blessed of women is jail. The leaders led, not just those who had titles, but we do see them leading in this story, but those who had opportunity to lead did exactly that and took the initiative. This is exactly what I've seen as we think about what's happened here in the last month or so. I've seen this very thing. And again, I give thanks to God that leaders lead and that leaders have led over the last six weeks or so. Let me just add my voice to the chorus of those uh, in various ways that are, are giving thanks for the elders that we have, for Mark and Brian and Mike. They're doing difficult work right now. I think you know that because I've seen the support that's been shared for them. But they're making hard decisions and trying to consider a lot of different factors. As we said, in a time when there's a lot of uncertainty and lots of different opinions, they are considering what is best for us, considering what is best for this congregation, and they are making uh, decisions based on that using their wisdom. And they're communicating that to us humbly and kindly, and they are willing, you should know, you may have seen this, willing to answer questions and to explain 
what it is that they're thinking and willing to admit that they may be wrong. Um, and so they are making decisions, they are communicating, and they're providing direction that we've been able to continue so much because they have overseen and provided direction for a way for us to continue to do this work and various types of work in this time of being separated. I thank God for our elders, the leaders that are leading among this people. But in line with what we see in Judges 5, I also thank God for people that are stepping up in a lot of different ways to take initiative to lead even without the, the title or the position. You know all of this stuff. But somehow, as, when all this started, somehow these things started popping up. Zoom classes started. And there are kids' classes, and someone had to organize those kids' classes. Someone is teaching those kids' classes. I'm still not really sure how that's, who's teaching those. Um, I'm not a part of them, okay? But the, 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 the teachers of those, uh, there are ladies' classes that have been organized. There are ladies that are leading those devotionals and teaching those classes. There's a men's call that's been organized, and men are taking initiative to, to lead those discussions. Um, men here, as you know, uh, in this very room that have taken the initiative to set up a system uh, through which we can do this live stream. And that doesn't, all that stuff that I've mentioned, we've mentioned before, doesn't include the other things that are going on. When people see a need and they step up to meet that need, leaders lead. And for those of you that realize that it, you don't need a position, you don't need a title to, to take initiative to do something that needs to be done, I thank you. I think the Lord commends you for uh, stepping up and showing initiative in that way. So, with the language of uh, Judges chapter 5, I bless the Lord and praise him and thank him that we have leaders who are leading. But the other piece of that, of course, is that people volunteer, that leaders lead, that people volunteer, bless the Lord. That's the other thing we see in Judges chapter 5. Let's read it a little bit. It's interesting. In, in Judges 5 verses 12 to 18, there is a, a catalog, a list of the various tribes, the various peoples in Israel and their responses to the call to battle that was put out by Deborah and Barak. Notice Judges 5, 12 to 18, excuse me. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of Abinuam. Then survivors came down to the nobles. The people of the Lord came down to me as warriors. From Ephraim, those whose root is in Amalek, came down. Following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Maker, commanders came down. And from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. And as was Issachar, so was Barak. Barak into the valley they rushed at his heels. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay in ships? Asher sat at the seashore and remained by its landing. Zebulun was a people who despised their lives even to death, and Naphtali also on the high places of the field. Did you catch the different descriptions here of the tribes? Verse 12 to 15, Ephraim, Benjamin, Macher, that's probably Manasseh, Zebulun, and Issachar, describes the people that showed up. They came and said, hey, we're with you. They were at Barak's heels running down the mountain. They showed up for the battle, and, and there's more that could be said. As you know, the poetry is a little bit hard to uh, distinguish. There could be a reference to the various things that they brought. Commanders, those that brought the staff of office. So maybe these are administrative folks, but they came bringing whatever they had. They showed up for the battle. But verse 15 and 16, interesting, says that Reuben had great resolves of heart. And maybe you think, oh, that's, yeah, Reuben was really resolved. But it says he had great resolves of heart and then says, why did you sit among the sheepfolds? And then says again in verse 16, among the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Sounds like Reuben really thought about it. You know, they were really torn up and really uh, maybe intended uh, to, to go to the battle. 
But in the end, they stayed by the sheepfolds and kept watch after that. Then there are others uh, in Gilead that may be referenced to Reuben again, but Dan and Asher, as much as it pains me to say it, Asher stayed home. Dan stayed home. It sounds like they were just busy. Stayed with the ships. Stayed with the things that they were uh, doing and didn't pay any attention to this call to battle. But in verse 18, we have Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun didn't count his life as something worthy of, of holding on to. He risked it all to go along with the battle and to join Deborah and Barak. We have those who show up to the battle in Judges 4 and 5, and we have those who stay home. This willing and supportive attitude, again, has been apparent over the last month, as much as the, the leadership of the leaders in our congregation, people have been showing up. Now, it's a little bit weird in this case because we're all trying to stay home, right? So you know what I mean when I say people stay home? In this story, they stayed home, meaning they were inactive. They didn't respond to the call. They didn't participate. They didn't join the work. But I've seen people join the work. I've seen people participate. When these things have, uh, have been decided and the elders have put out announcements and decisions that they've made, again, I don't know everything, but I've seen expressions of support and thanksgiving. People standing behind our leaders and saying, we're with you, we're praying for you. And I know, I, I just uh, imagine, I've heard them say it before, but I know that, that, that nothing means more to our elders than when people say, I'm praying for you and I'm behind you. But the things that have been started, the, 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 the streams, obviously, the classes, the, the men's and ladies' calls, the work that's been, people are, are joining, they're participating. Those things can't happen if it's, if it's just set up and then no one does it. People have been participating, people have been joining. And really, as you see here in Judges 5, verse 2, that's the, that, that completes the picture. That's the only way these things can be accomplished, is that people will show up, people will participate. And that's how we achieve that unity that is so good and so uh, pleasant. But let me just say a couple more things about this. Um, this type of volunteerism, um, offering ourselves willingly, you know, that, that is easier to do. You know this. It's easier to do when you agree with what's going on. What makes this hard is when you disagree or have a different opinion of what's being done. And so let me just uh, add that to the reasons for giving thanks and commending uh, those of this congregation. I know that not everybody in this congregation uh, thinks the same way about this. Um, again, I haven't taken a poll uh, of everybody, but it's just, we see that that's what's happening right now. We all think differently about this. We all have different opinions of what should be done. And, and I'm sure there are people that, that, don't even maybe agree with what the elders have decided and think a different route should be followed. Or maybe down the road you will uh, 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 decide that you don't agree with something. But that's when this is especially important. When we don't agree, when we would do it a different way, nevertheless, we still stand behind the leadership and we say, we're with you, we love you, we support you in what you're doing and what you're deciding, or these, these, these efforts that are, are started. And, and you know that, um, th that this goes far beyond whatever, you know, this will be over at some point, and we'll back to normal life, whatever that will look like. And, and so these things apply to all the things we're doing. You may not ag agree with the way things are done. You think, a singing and prayer service on 1.30, don't, don't they know that we have to go home and take naps and eat? And, you know, we can't come back for that. That's, that's, a, that's the worst idea I've ever heard, singing and prayer at 1.30. Well, as we see here, I'm sure there are maybe people in, in Judges chapter 5 that thought that the battle plan wasn't good or that it wasn't going to work, but they showed up. They participated. They put their support. They put their effort behind the leadership, and they said, we're with you, and we're going to stand by you. That is where the power is in the unity that we have and in and the work that we can do together. And the other thing I'll say before we uh, conclude this point is that are we sometimes like Reuben and the tribes of Reuben? We have great resolves of heart. I mean, I, I really, I, I'm going to get around to doing that. You know, you know that, that, that Zoom call they're doing on, you know, for, for the ladies on Saturday, that sounds like a really, really good thing. You know, I'm going to do that one of these days. Or that Acts class on Mondays, I, you know, I should really support that at some point. 
We have great resolves of heart. We have searchings of heart. Oftentimes, that actually makes us uh, a little bit miserable. That, um, you know, I, I, man, I really should do that. But will we move from that to, to actually doing? Or are we like Asher and Dan that we just, you know, I'm busy. I got things going on. I'm not going to worry about it. The work of the Lord is done because leaders lead and because people show up, they volunteer, they participate. And again, I just thank God for what I see in this congregation. And that's, again, what the song of, of Deborah and Barak is doing. It's, it's not really, in the end, focusing on the people. And I don't, in this lesson, really intend to focus on us, ultimately. What we want to do is, is exactly what the song says here. Bless the Lord. And in fact, the first uh, uh, few verses of the song after this says we're going to praise God because he's the one that has won the victory. Anything that we're doing right now, anything that can be accomplished by this congregation or by the people in it is because of the Lord, is because of, of his grace, because he enables us to do it. And so we want to give all praise and glory and honor to him. It's all because of God. It's all for him. And really, our unity, the unity that we have, is not in ourselves. Our unity is in the Lord when we look to him and serve him. And I want to remind you of the, the psalm we read at the beginning of our service that Michael read for us, Psalm 110. And notice the language here. As the psalmist describes the Messiah, these language, this language used of Jesus, of course, in the New Testament, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. That's about Jesus. You understand that. That's the picture of the Messiah. Ruling from the right hand of God, uh, reigning over Zion and conquering the enemies. But what does the Psalm say about the Messiah? Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. More than submitting and offering ourselves to, to the work that is led by the elders here, the work that's being done here, this is ultimately what we're doing. That we are offering ourselves willingly to King Jesus, who is leading us to victory and to eternal life. And that's where our unity is. And we want to make that clear. That our unity is in him. You know, we could, we could be really unified together in doing our own thing, right? We could kind of turn, in, turn this church into some kind of just social club where we just kind of get together, hang out, and just, you know, do fun things that we'd like to do. We could be really unified and really close and really tight-knit. But that's not what we're talking about. Because if we look at the big picture, of course, of what's going on in the history of our world, Jesus is king. He's the conquering king. All those that are with him are going to have eternal life and, and be victorious forever. And those that are against him, as the rest of this psalm says that we read, they're defeated and brought to punishment by King Jesus. And so this is where we find our unity. This is what, what, what we rally around. And as much as we are doing that, in, in doing the work of God and submitting to Jesus as our king, in him we find unity. And in him, together as a body, as a family of God in Christ Jesus, this is what we have to look forward to. The last verse of the Song of Deborah, Thus let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. I think you can see that. Remember, there, there was a storm that shook the earth when they were conquering the uh, armies of the Canaanites. Can you picture the scene on the battlefield as they have fought to exhaustion and the chariots and the Canaanites are fleeing for the hills and the clouds roll back and the sun shines through as God gives his people the victory. You know, the sun's going to shine again on this situation. We're going to be back here. We're going to meet together again. We're going to, to be able to see each other face to face. At some point, we're going to shake hands and give hugs. 
We're going to get back in this auditorium and sing all together again. I can't wait for that. The sun will shine again. But of course, in the bigger picture, the clouds of this world, the sickness, the death, the sin of this world, it will all be conquered. When Jesus, the Son, returns, tears will be wiped away, the clouds will be rolled back, and his brightness will shine in eternal life forever. And forever, we will, in Jesus, give ourselves to him and enjoy eternal life in his presence and in each other's presence, fully unified, fully connected in love, and perfect love, forever. That's what we're looking forward to. And all the work that we can do now is just a, a, a preview of that, uh, that beautiful picture we will enjoy forever. And so, of course, as we end, uh, I hope that we're thinking about that hope and maybe also asking ourselves if we have that hope, if that is what we are looking forward to and what it is that we can do to live out that hope right now in this, this crisis and with the time that we have uh, in this life. So we're going to conclude in prayer. And that prayer is meant to uh, wrap things up, but to be a moment of reflection on what I can do in response to the things that we've sung and prayed and studied this morning. Um, if you need something, we would ask you to contact us. If you're a member of this congregation, you know you have uh, a host of other people here that, that love you. You can text somebody, you can call somebody, you can reach out for help, for prayers. We encourage you to do that. But, but, but if you need to study more, you want to learn more about what it means to be in Christ, if you know that, that you need to be baptized to wash away your sins, please reach out to us and contact us. We'd be more than happy to, to talk with you, to study with you, to pray with you, and do what needs to be done to help you. But as we pray uh, and close, and then after a brief intermission, we will start our Bible class. Um, let, let's reflect on these things and take all these things to the Lord, our King and our Savior. Let's pray. O oh Lord our God, we have victory in you, and we have unity in you, as we are all joined together, and uh, not physically, but in our hearts and our minds, we are joined together uh, in spirit because um, we are your children. We thank you that you've called us your children, thank you that you've delivered us from sin, and thank you that you've brought us all together. I thank you, Father, uh, personally, for this congregation and for the unity that exists in it. And especially during this crisis, I thank you for the blessings that we've received. And in the midst of the hardships that have been experienced by many of us, I thank you for uh, the protection and the, the, the watching over us and for um, the work that's been done in response to uh, the difficulty and in, and in the encouragement and love of one another. Father, help us to join more closely together. Help us to join more closely to Jesus, to offer ourselves willingly to serve him and to fight for him, uh, regardless of the challenge uh, or the difficulty we face um, while we wait for him to return. And we pray for that hope, uh, that it would fill us up and motivate us to live uh, for him each and every day. But for now, we ask for your blessing and your grace, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.